Welcome everyone, you're watching David the Real Med White. And today this video is gonna be on the on book two of Clefir and the Pentateuch. If you haven't seen book the video done on book one, it's gonna be on top right and description below. You can check it out. It's a you can check out the playlist itself. The the entire video here is gonna be a playlist. And today we're today we're gonna be covering between Genesis six to Genesis fourteen in this uh, in this video and before I start I want to make this comment um, I want to make this one comment because I saw I don't know if it's my YouTube channel in particular or if it's just YouTube in general but I tend to have really disgusting people appear on my YouTube comments sometimes and this happened in the part one of the video I delete the comments so you can check it but I basically removed that guy but he basically claimed that I said that spiritual reading uh, claiming uh, spiritually reading something means atheism something stupid like that it claimed that I said something stupid like that basically blatantly lying what I say about the video what I say in the video about what I say in the video which is a strange thing because it's kind of a short video compared when we look into the topic that's discussed it's kind of a short video and most people will know that it's a lie but no, I never claimed that spiritual reading means atheism. What I did say is that some people have this understanding of spiritual reading that is basically atheism, right? If you understand spiritual reading, spiritual stuff basically as something non-existent, not real, but is metaphorical and in, the, in like makes sense in the, only in a very vague sense, you know, that new age kind of spirituality, that is atheism and I think that's undisputable. Anyone that's normal will understand that. But, you know, having made that, no, let's begin with this book. With, with a commentary on this book, I guess. Uh, today, we're going to be covering Noah's Ark and the Curse of Ham. We're going to be covering Tower of Babel. We're going to be covering Melchizedek. And two kind of extra things. These are not in the book of Genesis, but St. Cyril talks about this in his book. So I decided to add them in. That's about King Cyrus and Aaronic priest, Aaronic priesthood being a type of Christ's priesthood. So let us begin with Noah and the Ark. So I will be reading Bible verses so you can kind of understand what's going on here. This is Genesis 6, 1, 4. Uh, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Um, let's move on. Now, this is St. Cyril's commentary on this specific verse. So what St. Cyril says here is, so long as the holy race continued itself to be, uh, in itself to be unmixed with that which was inferior. Oh, 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 if you're a lip shit, oh, worrisome. If you're, if you're left ortho, which there is no such thing as a leftist orthodox, you should be worried about this. But St. Cyril basically, um, so, so long as the holy race continued itself to be unmixed with that which was inferior and while the uncont uncontaminated beauty and radiant purity of godly piety were still theirs, they were to be commended. But when they fell into the love of the flesh, they were drawn away by the beauty of woman into a state of rebellion. For it says that they took wives from all that they chose of the daughters of men, that is, from the daughters of Cain. Though they were called gods, sons of gods and sons of the mighty, they were then carried away to practice the habits of those others, being led into a shameful and profane conduct and lifestyle. And, uh, when he's saying though they were called God, it's referring to, I assume, Theosis, by the way. Furthermore, these women gave birth to extraordinary offspring. God, in fact, brought about a degradation in the beauty of their human bodies because of the woman's lack of self-control in their appetite for loose sexual relations. So those who were born to them were giants. That is to say, men who were savage and of great strength, afflicted with an extremely ugly appearance and possessing bodies of greater size than others. Now, this is a topic of discussion um, for that some people have. Uh, I think this is a topic of discussion from 
some certain church fathers. Some people think that the giants talked about in the Bible in this scenario uh, are real human beings. Saint Cyril is taking this view as evident here, and some others take the view that they were mythical creatures. They were not human beings, but they were something else. Um, I will say Saint Cyril's. I guess it makes more sense. This is what Saint Cyril thinks. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that. This is a disputed topic. This is a topic of contention. The fathers, from what I know, um, I'm not. I don't know much about this issue to say which one makes more sense. So I just, I'm just bringing it up to your face. So he argues that giants in biblical source had nothing to do with the giants of Greek pagan myths, because you also had. So maybe he's kind of alluding to that. You can say. Uh, but it seems like to me that Saint Cyril is basically saying they're human beings, but they're ugly. And uh, that's St. Cyril's commentary on this particular verse. Then we see Genesis 6, 5 to 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So this is this is anthropomorphic language. Some people will say, oh, God is like a normal human being. He's just like a superhuman being. That's why he regrets some of the things. That, no, this is anthropomorphic language. That is to say, language attributed to human beings uh, analogically being spoken of God, right? So this doesn't mean that God really felt sorry, you can say, Um in, in the sense that he was passionate, right? In the sense that he regretted the decision he made. God never regrets any decision he makes, but rather it's, again, a uh, human way of expressing yourself being applied to how we can understand God in this manner. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. <coughs> Moving on, Genesis six thirteen to 15 And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Now let's talk about what the ark itself means. So there are some, obviously, again, some messages here. And before I move on, I also want to say some of you might watching this, some of you watching this video might say, oh, but there's also, you missed on this and that and other aspect of this ark. You missed that uh, I'm following what St. Cyril said in his book. Doubtless there are things not mentioned that other fathers mentioned, but this is again, this is I'm focusing on what St. Cyril says here. Um, you can, I'm, for me, this is like a, kind of like a basics course, you can say, in understanding the, the Old Testament, you can say. So there's no need to get that uppity about it. I'm just following Glafir. Uh, in, even in that sense, I'm not following... 100% otherwise I'd basically copy pasting the book. You can go read the book for yourself as I said in the first video. Having said that, let's move on. St. Cyril calls the ark the church because it was through the ark that eight souls were saved and now the antitype, <clears throat> that is the prefigurement, which is baptism, is going to save us. Uh, <clears throat> he quotes 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, which actually talks about the ark. And St. Peter says, Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism. This is not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The ark's length, width, and height are recorded. The significance of it being recorded is that we shall acknowledge the length, width, and height of God's love. In fact, we see St. Paul in Ephesians 3, 18 to 19, may, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height 
to know the love of God, love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So St. Paul is again alluding to the ark when he's talking about the width, the length, the depth, and the height of God's love. Uh, St. Cyril in, in this passage says, Whereas the Greeks erroneously followed the polytheistic way of worship when we consider the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, though we do truly assign them their own distinct subsistences, it is our habit to adorn them with a unity of nature. It is as though by means of this identity of essence, we were raising up together the length, the width, and the height by that one cubit, so completing the ark. So he is basically critiquing polytheism here, and he's distinguishing polytheism with, uh, the tr with Trinitarianism by saying that God has one nature, that there's a unity of uh, nature, and they have identical nature, they have identical essence. And so they are one God. So obviously this is an acceptable way of speaking of, uh, you know, one God, obviously, in the, in the trying sense. There is one God because there is only one divine nature, right? This doesn't mean that other ways of speaking, like saying, I believe in one God, the Father, is heretical. That is also acceptable. Uh, it's just that the, saint, the saints use various different ways, right? Sometimes the Trinity is one God. Sometimes the Father is one God. These ways of speaking do not contradict with each other. So let's move on to talking about Noah's nakedness and the curse of Ham. Uh, the relevant Bible passage is Genesis 9, 18 to 27. It says, Now the sons of Noah and who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan, Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began, began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So what here is the sin, uh, the sin of Ham? The sin of Ham is dishonoring your parents. We should honor our parents. Dishonoring our parents is the committing the sin of Ham. Ham dishonored his own father because when he saw the nakedness of his father, this doesn't mean that Noah is completely blameless, obviously, but uh, when he saw the nakedness of his own father, he had two different options. One of them was what he did. The option is to basically call on his brothers. And it is implied here that he's basically making fun of his own father. Look at him. Look at that, he's, he's, he's naked and he's lying in his tent and he's drunk. Isn't that funny? Ha ha. Don't you see this in the modern world today? Uh, people making fun of their own family members. And the second option is the option that his own brothers took, which is to turn their face away from him, pretend it didn't happen, cover their own fathers, not even look at his nakedness, and then just walk away. He chose the first option, and that's the sin of Ham. <clears throat> St. Cyril talks about this Old Testament event relating to the New Testament. And he says, again, warning, trigger warning to all the leftist so-called Christians who want to pretend to be Orthodox. You are not going to like some of the things that St. Cyril is going to say. So we see all of, a lot of these agitators in this world, um, complete leftists, they claim to be Christian. They're nothing, nothing about them is Christian. They completely borrow leftist way of thinking. And so when you, say, when you say certain things that a Christian will normally say, they basically call you a racist, Nazi, anti-Semitic, you're a bad, evil person. Now let's read what St. Cyril says here, okay? And by the way, you can't just, your excuse cannot just be rhetoric. Oh, he's just saying this rhetorically, right? 
um, I can make the same argument because like when I say these things, I'm just using rhetoric, dude. I'm just using rhetoric too. We're all using rhetoric when we're saying these things that you think are evil. But let's read what St. Cyril says here. That those among the Jews who came to believe in la later times, by the way, I'm, I'll probably, this video at least, will probably get demonetized because of some of the things St. Cyril says. Hey, YouTube, look, it ain't me. I'm just reading what a, what a church father says. Don't blame me. Uh, in later times, we'll be the first partakers and fellow residents since they were brought together into a single city or dwelling or home, which is the church. Noah indicated when he said, May God enlarge Japheth, that is, the third and final people, for Japheth was the third son, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, that is, of the first son, and let Canaan be their servant. This, I believe, is what Christ said to the people of the Jews. Truly, truly, I say to you that everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free. Here is the trigger warning to, to your leftists. For the wretched Jews who mocked the incarnation of our Savior and failed to honor the revelation of Him, the revelation given to us from God the Father have remained in a spirit of bondage. So what St. Cyril is saying here is that Jews... Uh, reject Christ and that is the sin of rejecting Christ they have been bondage to sin uh, like Ham became a slave of Japheth Ham became bondage to sin he became as bond servant as one could say just like the Jews got became slaves to sin Ham also became a slave so the Old Testament event, St. Silas says here, this particular Old Testament event is prefiguring what will happen in the New Testament, what Jews will do to their true Messiah. Now let's move on with the Tower of Babel, another biblical event, popular biblical event. A lot of misconceptions about the Tower of Babel. Uh, lot, you see a lot of stupid, stupid, stupid views about the Tower of Babel. For example, Richard Spencer Basically saying we need to build our own Tower of Babel, which I don't want to talk about him because he's a he's a clown. But what's um actually I'm not I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, but you know you see all of these Gnostic views of Tower of Babel. So let's talk. Let's see what Genesis says first. Genesis eleven one to nine. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and let us go down in there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Now, before we talk about the significance of the Tower of Babel, here's one of the misconceptions is that some people think that in the in this biblical event showing, oh God is afraid that human beings will ascend to where he is, that that they will replace him. Now you see this this is I even if it's not worded like that, sentimentally speaking, you this is the view that a lot of people have about the Tower of Babel. Um, this is idiotic. This is completely not true. God is not afraid that people reach heaven. You can say he's afraid, but not for himself, but for you, actually. Uh, God confused the languages of the people because had they been allowed to fulfill their project, right, the Tower of Babel, their sin will reach to a point of no return, right? So this is the concept I talked about in a previous video in my, you can say commentary. I don't, I don't want to call it a commentary, but I guess 
a reading that I have on the book of Maccabees, you can say, um, where there is such a thing as a point of no return. And St. Cyril talks about that concept here. He says, God did not want them want them to be condemned even more. So he prevented them so they don't reach to that point of no return where they basically reach heaven and they experience hell, right? He doesn't want that to happen. So this was a necessary thing in a sense that had to happen and, and God did this. Um, meaning that the confusion of language is an act of kindness and mercy it's not a punishment. This is not a punishment. This is an act of kindness and mercy. This is an act of protection, not a punishment. And here's the lesson that we can learn from the Tower of Babel. Do not do things, do not attempt to do divine things without the, without the blessing and help from God. Don't try to do God's job all along. Don't try, to, don't try pulling that. This kind of understanding of... Um, you know, trying to do divine things alone without the help of God has been the spirit of our age for the last three centuries, I will say, three, two or three centuries, this has been the spirit of this world, just trying to do divine things without the help of God, right? Trying to, oh, and this is the common thread within all utopianist, all utopia, right? All utopian political ideologies, whatever they may be, have this very spirit trying to achieve a perfect world without God. Basically telling God, I will achieve the perfect world. I do not need you. Most political ideologies today are, on, are unfortunately like that. Most political people are unfortunately like this. Um, I was at the time of making this video. There is this whole election she bang going on in the United States. I'm, I'm obviously aware of that. I have, I have my own comments, but obviously this is not the video. To do this so now let's look at saint seal's um more detailed commentary so this is again a portion from the book god confused their very languages for the things that ought to be done only through the ability and authority of the maker are not appropriate for any other to do except for him alone so the transformation of speech and the increasing of the difference in the sound of words one might just then truly attribute to the one who alone is by nature the maker now what happened surely ought not to escape a great deal of ridicule, and fittingly so. For those people supposed, though they did not know how, that they were entirely capable of building a tower out of brick and mud that will reach even to heaven itself. So they serve as another figure, I believe, of the stupidity of the Jews, who supposed that they could make for themselves a relationship with God. In effect, they thought that the way up to heaven was not through choosing to do those things pleasing to God and esteemed by Him, nor was it true faith in Christ, but by raising up some sort of tower, foolishly thinking that solely by the bare repute of their forefathers, they could attain the highest things. For as they were con constantly citing the name of Abraham, and by such earthly repute were building up as it were their own glory, they have ever stood condemned. Uh-oh. Wouldn't it be funny if I posted this on, if, if someone posted this on Twitter, in like some normie docs, group or like on facebook or whatever just this right and like just just frame it like this here's here's what i think about the tower of babel story and like um here i just want to talk about my thoughts and below a paragraph i'll talk about the thoughts and just says exactly what i said here what i uh, just read here and just didn't say this is from saint Kill. just said this is my thoughts right first of all that will be plagiarism obviously but that's not the point that i'm making here how many normie docs do you think will look at that and say you can't speak like that. That's that's not you're not a Christian. That's not what a Christian would do. You you will have tons of normie dogs spurging out over this, right? I'm not wrong, am I? I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. You'll definitely see a lot of people going crazy. And then the same person like looks at the comments of the, of people saying this and then he says, "Hey, um those are actually not my thoughts. I, that's literally a copy-paste from a book St. Cyril of Alexandria wrote. Here's the book. You can check it out for yourself. And it, what, I'm what I'm saying is that, is that oops, I, I smacked my phone. Well, technology is evil, so I'm just kidding. Technology is <laughs> inherently evil. Um, although it does cause you to do a lot of evil things naturally. But what I'm getting at here is that a lot of these normie docs are so quick to condemn just because you seemingly 
have a you know you know who language i'll say you seemingly have a you know who language and they're so quick to condemn and you speak like that you're not a christian when so many church fathers speak of, speak this way i mean saint Cyril is not the only one there's so many other church fathers that speak of speak of these things in this way and even if you read the intro of this book i mean I think half of the intro is basically trying to do damage control. Why Saint Cyril says things like this, says hurtful things about such an oppressed, uh, innocent minority. Obviously, they're not they're a minority, but they're not oppressed nor are they innocent. Um, well, you can say maybe they're oppressed. You get my point. Let's read more. Moreover, yet God reproved those who planned to build the tower and divided them into speakers of many languages. And we may say that in a certain way that what then befell them was a declaration in advance of the things that happened to the Jews. For since they had minds set upon greatly exalted matters, true which, true which things they were seeking the way to heaven above, he scattered them among those of many different languages, that is, among all the nations. For being driven out of their homes, they were dispersed from their own lands and cities and became wanderers among the nations, as the prophet said. I also want to note, because people are going to take the opposite extreme view, so I kind of want to prevent that as well. Um, this doesn't mean St. Cyril or Christians in general hate Jews, but this is kind of like, you can consider this as a, as a big brother angrily chiding his stupid younger brother, you can say, in some in some senses. So it's not like, yeah, screw those Jews, they're going to hell. No, 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 no. That's not what's going on here. It's, you know, using heavy language doesn't mean you hate them. And this is the this is kind of the thing in our culture. If you use heavy language, if you call someone an idiot, or if you call them, if you say they're stupid, if you say they did something wrong, especially in Western culture, it's associated with hating that kind of a person. Even in this Eastern culture, you kind of have this idea, but... Right, so this understanding is completely not Christian. Using heavy criticism, heavy language with the right spirit is actually not a bad thing to do. In fact, that's precisely what Jesus Christ does. And Christ will be, will be using heavy language to all of us, me, you, every single one of us. He will criticize us very, very harshly. But he won't hate us either. He will love us. That's why he will do that. And that's why St. Cyril is doing these things to explain to these people, look, if you follow what the Jews did, this is what's going to happen to you, in a way. Moreover, so then, in connection with the tower, the speaking in many languages was a sign of the scattering and the expulsion into all nations. But in connection with Christ, it was a sign of the gathering together into the unity of the Spirit and of the way up to heaven. For Christ has become our strong tower, as the psalmist says, which conveys us up to the heavenly city, and unites those upon the earth with the cars of holy angels. So the purpose of the Tower of Babel was fulfilled in the person of Christ. It is his tower, and the Psalm is Psalm 61.3. I don't know if it's, if it's Septuagint or Masoretic, but it says Psalm 61.3 in my notes, that we have reached to the heavens. You can say that the tower, Christ's tower, is his body, because it's a temple, right? Um yeah. So let's move on to the next topic of discussion. Abraham and Melchizedek. Uh, this is from Genesis fourteen eighteen to 20. Abraham meets Melchizedek. And this is the more crucial part of the verse. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe to all. Hebrews 7, 18 and 19, St. Paul says here, For on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and, pro and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And... Um, So what this points out here in Hebrews is that the old law was the new law is superior to the old because the old uh, purpose was to lead to the new, right? The, the purpose of the old covenant was to lead to the new, which is why he's talking about the annulling 
The annulling here is not saying, okay, this never happened, you can say bye-bye, but rather the old has been fulfilled, right? So this does not contradict when Christ says, I came here to fulfill the law, right? Th what St. Paul is saying here is not contradicting here. In fact, it's complementing what Christ is saying. Uh, this also applies to Levitic priesthood and Melchizedekian priesthood. Mel the priesthood of Melchizedek is the superior form of priesthood that the Levi Levitic priesthood is move trying to move us towards to. Uh, yes. So Melchizedek is a type of Christ and a type of Christ's superior priesthood. Uh, and this is a topic of discussion among some people. Is Melchizedek Christ? Is it a Christophany? Is Melchizedek the Holy Spirit? So in St. Cyril's time, uh, some people thought that Melchizedek was the Holy Spirit. And they made some arguments, oh, because the names attributed to Melchizedek and he didn't have any lineage, right? These common arguments that you will hear because Melchizedek was said to not have any lineage and all that kind of stuff. Now, uh, St. Seal makes a theological argument here. Uh, and he basically, first of all, he says Melchizedek was a real human person. He was the king of Salem. Um, he was a real human being. All right. And those who get stuck up on the names attributed to him, right, him having no lineage and whatnot, uh, are basically taken in a fallacious way. They're, they're leading themselves to mistakes and they're getting hung up on these terms uh, and bringing themselves onto more confusion. So then St. Seal says, okay, let's assume Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit. If that was the case, then the Holy Spirit will be consecrated by God because Melchizedek is consecrated, is a consecrated high priest. Uh, then that will mean the Holy Spirit was consecrated by God. But how can God be consecrated by God, right? This will basically imply that the Holy Spirit is not God and is in fact subordinate to God the Father um, because the consecration is done by someone superior, right? An inferior person gets consecrated by a superior person. And then you might say to this argument, but wait a second, Jesus Christ is God. And he was con like he was consecrated too, and he was you know he was baptized by the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that mean? But according to that logic, shouldn't we say that Christ is subordinate and inferior also? Now, surprisingly, to surprising monophysites, if they read this book, Saint Cyril here makes a diophysite argumentation here. St. Cyril says, now that argument doesn't apply to Christ because that is proper. Christ did get consecrated, right? The word of God is high priest, yes, but he's not subordinate to God the Father. Why? Because he became man. And him being ordained to priesthood is proper to his humanity, which is indeed inferior to his divinity. Uh, so what is being said here, essentially, is that Christ can be high priest because he's a hu because he became a human being. He became human. He became flesh and he dwelt among us. And so that is proper to his humanity. And call him, us calling him high priest will not subordinate his divinity. So here you see, I will say, quite an explicit diophysite argumentation um, when it concerns the person of Christ. Now, obviously, you will still have an offside saying, oh, but we don't have any problems with this kind of language. Maybe you don't, right? Maybe, maybe you don't. But the problem, the, the issue here is it's, incons it's inconsistent with your theology. It's inconsistent with what you're trying to go with here. Um, that is the point. So, essentially, why... Christ nor the Holy Spirit could not be Melchizedek, well, because they're, they're God, they cannot be consecrated, right? If they were consecrated, who will they be consecrated, right? Someone superior. That will have to be God the Father. That's subordination, it's Matarianism, right? You, if you say Christ is Melchizedek, since those arguments be, will basically say, oh, that will mean um, Arianism. Applying to the Holy Spirit, that will be Macedonianism. So that's why we have to say Melchizedek is a real human being. Now, are there fathers that say Melchizedek is Christ? 
I there probably is not there there probably aren't any um uh, from my but maybe maybe there is maybe there is I I doubt it but I'm not going to make any definitive statements because I'm not too sure so this concludes or Bible discussion, you can say, about Genesis 6 to 14. So I have two extra uh, topics for us to discuss because St. Cyril talks about this in book two, and I felt like, you know, why not add them in here? So the first one is going to be about King Cyrus. And, uh, right, let's talk about King Cyrus first. St. Cyril says here, now Cyrus, Kyrus, well, I'm going to say Kyrus actually, whose mother was Mandane, the daughter of Astiges, Astiges, a ruler of the Medes, and whose father was Cambyses, Cambyses, whatever, I can't, I can't read this, sorry, <laughs> of the race of Persia, was extremely moderate in his ways. Uh, moderate meaning fair and reasonable, as said in the footnote. Therefore, certain of the ancients called Skiros a mule, and also one of a different nature. This was, I, I suppose, because his father and mother were of different races. For the Persians of a nation different from the Medes. You see then how this relates to Christ. For with respect to the flesh, he was born of a mother, the Holy Virgin, who was of human nature as we are. His father, however, was not at all like us, but if we might express it so, he was of a completely different race, quite removed from us in nature, surpassing everything that was created. Accordingly, Christ said to the Jews who taught that he was like us and was born as we are, You are from below, I am from above. So obviously this is a refutation of uh, of what we will call Vignas because he is a promotion of race mixing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm joking. But uh, St. Cyril is using the example of King, um, King Cyrus' race mixed upbringing. He says King Cyrus being race mixed is signifying the birth of Christ. Now isn't that such an interesting argument? I think that's quite an interesting argument actually. Uh, and... I want to focus on the Christ part is is essentially because you can say you know of a different nature right so he's of a divine nature and he's also out of a human nature thus being in two natures uh you can you can say that it's cool perhaps even allude to the double birth because that's also a connected thing um maybe but here the main focus is that just like uh, King Cyrus is out of two different races, and he, you can say, race mixed, Christ is also out of two natures, although the natures are not mixed, so to say the divine not, becomes not divine, the human becomes not human and or. Uh, they're still distinct, they still preserve their identity, they still are what they are, but you can say in that sense that applies, right? There's no, uh, I mean, even in the sense of like, I guess you will say that applies because it's not as if King Cyrus beca became a Cyrusian, but he just became, you know, two races, I guess you can say in that sense, right? That's That will be St. Cyril's logic. But I will say that's also in a way, I mean, kind of deophysite. Uh, when we say like Cyrus is out of two races, you can say he's, you know, he's also in two races. That doesn't mean Cyrus becomes two different people, right? There is no like... Persian Cyrus and like this, like Median, uh, Median Cyrus, right? Uh, and the, the the identity of the races are still present here. And I don't want to bring like this American tier racial con. We don't we don't need any of that kind of stuff, right? We're normal people here. We're people. I, I turned into a, <laughs> is I turned into a strange guy. I can. We're not. We're normal people here, right? We're normal people here. We don't resort to Marxist critical race theory nonsense here. We're biblical. We're scriptural. We're patristic. King Cyrus typifies Christ because he also rules as a king, just like how Christ is king, right? King Cyrus decreed a temple to be built. Christ's body is a temple, and he established the superior temple you can say that, you know, King Cyrus decreed a temple to be built. Christ decreed his own temple to be built. You can say he created his own temple, in fact. Just like King Cyrus created the temple to be built. And Cyrus is also, I believe, he's called the Christ because he was also anointed. Christ means anointed. Isaiah forty four twenty eight. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd 
and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. So you see here very obvious um, foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. King Cyrus did the will of God. Jesus Christ also does the will of the Father likewise. In a different way, Cyrus does by aligning his gnomi, his gnomic will to God's will, whereas Christ does his Father's will according to uh, his divine nature. And aligning his human will to his divine nature, obviously, freely. And finally, let's talk about Aaron and Moses. Uh, Exodus 4, 10 to 17 then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Again, anthropomorphic speech, don't forget that. God does not get angry. He's not a human being. He doesn't have human emotions. Well, Christ has human emotions uh, because he became man. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God, and you shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do the sign. And that reminded me, you see Muslims making the argument from Isaiah saying, God is not a man. And um, they say, oh, God is not a man. That means Christ Jesus cannot be God. No, God is not a man is saying what I'm saying. When when uh, When... When scripture says God is not a man, it says we use anthropomorphic language for God, but God is not a man, right? He doesn't become angry like a human person will. That's what it means. So Muslims, don't make that stupid argument, please, or I'm going to make a video. Top 10 stupid argument Muslims make against Christianity and abuse you and make fun of you. That's actually a great idea. I should make that. <laughs> um, maybe one day. So Aaron the high priest and Christ the high priest Aaron is a type of Christ because the Levite priests were tithed, but all the Levite priests tithed to Aaron. And only Aaron was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies once per year with blood. Who in this way typifies Christ who died for or since? Um, so yeah, and that will conclude this video. Uh, this was book two of Glyphira on the Pentateuch. Again, as I said in the first video, if you want to read this book in full, you can go buy it for yourself. I will encourage you to do so. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good book. And uh, obviously, I'm not going to be covering every single thing of the book because as I said, if I covered every single thing, I will just have to be copy pasting the book naturally. Um, so... Yeah, that will cover it. Next is going to be on book 3, which I believe is on Genesis 15 to 27. So we're going to be covering 12, 13 chapters, I believe. Lots of different stuff there. Hopefully this helps you out. Again, this is kind of like a beginner's kind of thing. And I kind of do assume that you have at least some scriptural knowledge, some knowledge of the biblical events and what happens there. And obviously, you know, you have to go read the Bible for yourself. You have to go read uh, scripture commentary for yourself. What I'm trying to do here is, you know, kind of making it easy at the same time, um, making it easy to, in the sense it's kind of encouraging you to do the same for yourself. You know, take the time to read scriptures, take the time to read what the fathers say. I believe a lot of the stuff said in here is also said in the Orthodox Study Bible as well. well, as well. So definitely go buy the Orthodox Study Bible if you have not already. And that will conclude this video. So again, thank you all for watching this video. And I'll see you guys in my next showing. God be with you all, boys.